Welcome, Mr. Mark Thor. Thank you. So, thank you very much. And um, I've already had an eventful morning. I, I was unable to get my own laptop working here, so I was going to do live demos. So while you've been enjoying the first few speeches, I went next door and I've recorded a few videos. So I'm going to substitute my live demo for some near real-time videos. Um, so let's see how that goes. Um, first of all, it's fantastic to be here. I've, I've been very fortunate to travel the world, but this is my first time ever in Sarajevo. So um, I'm exploring your city and learning more about the local companies and culture all the time. So it's uh, really great to be here, and I'm uh, appreciative of the invite from uh, the team here. Before I start, um, I just want to get a feel for the audience. How many of you would consider yourself business orientated? Um, could you maybe put your hand up if you're more business? Okay. Uh, okay. And, and what, what about developers? Okay. About half. And the rest of you are somewhere in between or are sleeping at this point <laughs> after the coffee. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So what, I, what, I've, what I've done in my presentation is I, I want to originally to mix both up, talk a little bit about what I think is going off out there and why it's important for organizations, why it presents an opportunity for developers, but also then I, I, I intended to go quite deep and to start opening up and showing you code and building a live demo on the stage. Um, apparently I can't do that because this is not my laptop, um, so we'll see how we can bring that to life as best we can. So. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is something I call exponential times. You, you guys probably have heard about this digital disruption, industry 4.0. I hate those phrases, so I created my own. Um, and I, I call this exponential times. And if you, if you know what an exponential curve is, it starts off and it's very slow. And at some point, it goes up really, really quickly exponentially, even that's what's called an exponential curve. And what I like to think about is the gap at the bottom is the difference between those who are doing something and those who are not doing something. So here's the thing. You can be doing nothing today. You can be learning nothing about IoT, nothing about artificial intelligence. Companies can be doing nothing as well. And the gap between them and those that are is very small at the moment. But one day, one day, somebody will make a breakthrough. A company will do something revolutionary, or you as a developer will come up with this great new idea that you can do something differently. And suddenly, the curve will go. And if you've not been learning and doing something, it's really hard to catch back up, all right? Because the curve is exponential. So when I talk to companies, the thing I talk to them about is, look, you may not believe that IoT and analytics and artificial intelligence is important at this present moment in time, and in fact, the difference between doing it and not doing it in your market right now might not be that important. But there will come a time in the future. Now the question is, when is that? Is it next week? Is it one year? Is it five years? I don't know the answer for your market specifically. But there will come a time when it's super important. And when that happens, if you're not on that journey, you will never catch up again. Right? And that includes developers. You will just be lost in the sea of the change of what's going off, and it includes organizations. So I implore developers and companies today to start to play. And in fact, there's a, a hackathon with one of our partners next door. I've been looking at what they're doing there, little smart door application, so a little plug for them there. Um, it's a fantastic way to start getting to know the technology, understanding the capabilities of what it can do, even if it doesn't directly apply to what you're doing today. It's about making sure that when that curve goes, you can go with it. And if we think about why this is important, and we look at the, the history of companies, what we can now see is that, you know, 100 years ago, a company got onto the S&P 500, and they were there for 67 years. So when you made it, you were like, woohoo, I'm there. Now that doesn't work anymore, right? It's down to 15 years today, and by 2020, the estimate is that um, only 25% of the companies that make up this S&P 500 will still be on this list. So there's going to be this dramatic change of the organizations that are driving our, our world forwards, and um, that's driven by this exponential curve. 
opinion, there will be more companies that miss the curve than people that hit the curve, okay? So I always like to go with a quote, and this is one of my favorite quotes, not just in business, but in life. And that's um, you know, the secret to change is to focus all your energy going forwards, not backwards, right? So I've stopped worrying about a live demo now. I just need to make sure you know why I'm showing videos. And I just look forwards. And I think for organizations and developers, we have to take that same attitude. We have to say, look, we may be very successful where we are today, and we might be doing fantastic things, but this change is coming, and I need to look forwards and go with that change. So let's switch to the topic at hand, the Internet of Things. We're at an IoT summit. I find it very hard to differentiate IoT and, and take it separate from artificial intelligence, another topic I'm very involved in, because very often they come very closely together. But the Internet of Things isn't a technology revolution. I'm about fed up of people talking about 50 billion devices, connectivity. I'll put some of those slides up later. I'm bored of that. Technology is an enabler. IoT is not a technology revolution. I don't care what anybody says. If they say, my platform's the best platform in the world, and blah, 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 blah. Okay? And I come from a software company. All right? And I'm going to talk about our platform. But it isn't a technology revolution. It's a business revolution that this technology is now enabling. So what's happened is things like sensors have become so cheap that you can now put them into places and solve business problems in ways that you couldn't solve them before. Connectivity is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So now I can put things on things that are traveling and moving and doing things, which was very expensive and hard to do before. So the technology isn't really a revolution. I mean, Microsoft was doing M2M work and embedded systems in, in um, advertising systems, in ATMs, 10 years ago. Windows Embedded has been around forever, right? Microsoft has been doing IoT for more than 10 years, if not longer than that. Most other people have just written it on their marketing slides now, right? They've just tagged it on. So I'm really proud to work at a company that understands that IoT isn't a new technology. There are new enablers and there are new things coming that give us that power, but it's about a business revolution fueled by that technology. So what we're now seeing because of this technology is this convergence of the physical and the digital worlds, right? We can now put sensors on everything. Um, I'll talk about that later. Seriously, we have one customer who's doing the internet of cows and they've put sensors on their cows and as the cows walk around the fields, they can actually tell roughly whether they're likely to be delivering more milk or whether they're likely to be ready to procreate, okay? So create more baby cows, okay? Yes. So um, these worlds are colliding. And what you're finding now is almost everybody is trying to digitize every physical thing, okay? And it's, it's coming faster and faster, and it's things that sometimes you go, really? They, they're really putting a sensor on that? And you're like, huh? And I'm going to show you an example later of an oyster farm, right? So the growth of oysters is now being enabled through IoT as well. So, you know, we do have these four sort of things when we define it. I'm going to start at this level. You can see the connected device, as you can see how much money people make in theory if they do things. You can see where all the data is going to come from. and You can see the market size. But ultimately, what we're talking about is um, connecting things, control the things, gain insights from them, and then take some action. And if you drop down one level lower, you get to the physical things that you have today, uh, elevators, right, chairs. Uh, I can tell you a story of a company who manufactures hospital beds and you know one of the biggest costs in hospital beds for hospitals is lost beds you might laugh but think about this a patient gets moved from one hospital to the other and they go on a bed and they get moved and somebody takes them in and leaves the bed there and leaves and the bed's gone right and some of these beds are not cheap uh, I can tell you one bed with all of the motors from a company is over 10,000 euros. So if you lose 10 of those in a year, you're losing 100,000. Somebody somewhere is gaining that and selling them. I don't know, but 
Um, you'd hope that there's a balancing act, but the point is, people are even instrumenting beds to know where they are. Um, down in Greece, we had the big collapse in Greece of all of the economy there. And what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of the, the um, vending machines that are giving out Coke and things in shops, so actually fridge, fridges, not vending machines, the fridges, they, they're basically given to the store owners if they will display these goods in them. When all of these little shops went boom during the crisis, half of these refrigerators disappeared. And nobody knows where they are. Okay, so they're now instrumenting their refrigerators and putting GPS in them just to track their refrigerators. Um, so let's not underestimate things. Things is a really big topic and um, you, you'd be surprised. Connectivity, clearly there's many different ways you can connect up to the cloud or take data locally. I think we've got a price point thing coming there. We've got a range thing. There's a lot of challenges here with security, uh, transport of, of data. Then you get your data and you start doing something with it, and then you need to drive some action. So when I think about IoT, I, I generally think across these four areas, uh, five areas, sorry, but I think about that in a business sense. So I start thinking about, okay, um, what is the business thing I'm looking to do, and then work back to which things do I need to instrument to achieve that aim? How frequently do I need the data coming from those things? That talks about my connectivity. Um, then I start thinking about, okay, am I just looking at my data and visualizing it, or do I need to put something more intelligent behind it? That's where I think about, is it just data and visualization or data and predictive analytics and AI? And then the action, for me, if you detect something and take no action, you're wasting your time, you may as well not do it in the first place. So if you're just capturing all this stuff, but you can't put a feedback loop into your operational systems or back to the actual device, you're, it's a complete waste of time. Okay, so every company is becoming a software company. I talked about the, the Internet of Cows. That's this guy over here. We actually have a company called G-Paws that lets you do Fitbit on your dog. So you, if your dog's a little bit overweight, you can put a Fitbit on your dog and, and um, you can actually go out and you can get your dog a little bit more thin, uh, see how many calories your dog is burning. Um, Elevators, I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, ThyssenKrupp is a very large customer of Microsoft. Um, and what they are doing is they put sensors on their elevators. So what a lot of people don't realize is um, elevators in the old days, they'd go up and down, okay? That's normal, hopefully, unless they're broken. Um, and what would happen is the service engineers would turn up every uh, month to check the elevator, whether it was working or not working. And if it broke in between, then you would get a, a panic call from somebody saying, come and fix my elevator. The guy would go along, he'd check the elevator. If something was broken, sometimes he didn't have the part, so then he would have to leave the premises, go find the part, come back, fit it. And this was costing quite a lot of money. And so what ThyssenKrupp has done is they've actually instrumented all their elevators with the remote monitoring, and they can predict the failure of parts in elevators. So now, in fact, they can actually call a customer up and say, hey, look, we've been watching the data. We think we need to send an engineer out to you tomorrow. Can he come out? And he will turn up with the part that's likely to fail, and he will fix it before it breaks. Um, and they're now offering that as a service to other elevator manufacturers. So we'll talk about that later as well, because it's not just about how you innovate yourself, but how you can maybe create new business models and new lines of business for your organization. Okay, so there's a lot of very interesting stuff going off out there. And, uh, but ultimately, every company becomes a software company. Everything becomes smart. I was talking with Maersk, the big shipping container company. And um, they're basically saying, we used to be an IT group that looked after servers. Now we're a software development company. You know, he has to now worry about DevOps uh, and continuous improvement of services and launching a minimum viable product, right? Get it out quickly. You know, spending three years in a waterfall lifecycle model to build something just doesn't work anymore. It's got to go out and then improve very rapidly. And that's the sort of things we see. And services are defining the winners and losers. If you look at Uber and Lyft, for example, that are doing super well and Airbnb, they don't actually own any of the things, but what they're acting as is a broker, and they're able to actually connect through services somebody that supplies to somebody who consumes. Um, and they've completely taken out the middleman. Okay, so services define the winners and losers. So 
If you're a company and you're not thinking about services, then you probably need to move a little bit. Otherwise, when everybody else does, you're going to miss that point of inflection. Um, and services could come in many shapes and forms. It's, there isn't one size fits all. But I often tell people on IoT, start out looking at places where you're doing things repetitively with humans, right? If you're checking a meter every week because you have to, or if you're taking a car or asking somebody to bring a car in every 15,000 kilometers for a service because you have to. So anywhere where there's a repetitive process that you're doing because it feels like the right time to check it or your service level forces you to do it. The next thing is to look into any process where um, people are logging things manually, right? So people who drive trucks often have to write little logs about where they went and when they went and how many kilometers, look at that sort of thing. And then you can start to go further into some of the new use cases. So this is kind of the, the scenario that we see. We see people start out with IoT generally, unless they're a startup. So I'm going to work here off the assumption that you're an established organization. You start out looking at efficiency. How can I get some sensors on things, start getting some transparency into what's going off inside of these processes and with these things? Can I use that information then to reduce costs? That's where we see things like preventative maintenance to lower cost. Then we move into innovation, and there we say, okay, now what I'm going to do is collect data about these things and use it to improve my product. So this is a connected product type setup. So I can tell you an honest story. I was out talking to a toothbrush manufacturer, right? Toothbrush manufacturer. Yes, they are now connected toothbrushes. Uh, you can buy them. They are very cheap. Uh, they come with really cool apps for your kids that like make funny faces as they're doing things to try and get your kids using their their toothbrush, but funnily enough, by putting these sensors in, they collect uh, the data about how the toothbrush has been used, which angle, how, how fast is it going up and down, and they use that actually to improve the design of the toothbrush. Okay, so they are using the usage data to improve the toothbrush. There's a car manufacturer. I was in Greece presenting on Tuesday, and I presented with Volvo, and one of the things we talked about there is um, how they're collecting data about brake usage and brake wear. So Different people drive differently. They don't care who it is. They're not tracking you personally. But they can see if the brakes are hit in this sort of shape, in this sort of road condition, this is the wear on the brake. And they're actually passing that back to their engineering team to improve how they manufacture the brakes, the actual brake pads in the car. So they're using that data not to improve efficiency, but actually to innovate and improve their physical product that they deliver to you in the first place. And then business transformation. So everybody talks about IoT. It's the sexy world of what most people are not yet doing. Um, most people are in these two spaces, um, putting efficiency and innovating. But then there's some really interesting stuff that is starting to come out here. So can I, can I really transform the way my business runs? Rolls-Royce would be a good example here. And I, I was going to show it live. I've got a video. but. They've moved from selling engines purely to selling power by the hour. So while the engines are running, they earn money, which is good for the airlines because the airlines only earn money when their planes are flying. So they both are now in the same game together. So if Rolls-Royce can keep those, those engines running, they're paid a service fee for doing that. It's a completely different business model to shipping a physical thing. I was also talking with Volvo again on Tuesday and they're doing things here, so they're working on home delivery to your car. If they have GPS in your car, they know where you are, and you allow them to. They can share that data with, say, a DHL, and DHL can come and deliver the things to your car because it knows where you are. And then they've got remote opening and unlocking of your car, and they can actually pass a code for a time period to the driver so they can unlock your car when you're not there using system. So they unlock your car, they know it's been opened by a DHL person, in goes the, the package, they close it, they know the door's open and closed, they know how long it was open for, um, and they can do some pretty smart things. And that's a completely new business model for Volvo. They go into the delivery business, but not the logistics side of delivery, but the receiving of deliveries. Very interesting. And then imagine now that you could pull that and you could you can imagine some, some guy setting up a van somewhere in the middle of nowhere that people could deliver to. Um, I can see all sorts of things here. 
So the next slides here really talk about that same thing. So I'm going to go through those reasonably. I'll just skip through them. I talked about a lot of this. It, it sort of tells you, look, if you want to do certain things here, like if you want to use analytics, you first need the historical data to build the model off. So when you first connect the data, you can't do analytics, right? Let's just be honest. Anybody that tells you you can, they're lying. Um, you can't. You need historical data to do something. Now, if you've already been collecting some of that through SCADA systems or something, if you've already been collecting some machine data, you can, of course, use that to build your first pass of a model and then iterate and retrain over time. But if, if you've never connected anything and you have no data, it's very hard to build a model, at least one that I would trust. Okay, so those slides really talked about things you need to have in place. Now, it's not just what I think. If you take a look at IoT surveys out there, 73% um, of the companies that were contacted as part of this survey were doing something with IoT. They were thinking about it. They were building a prototype. They were training some developers. They were messing around with Raspberry Pis. Some people were doing more advanced things. Um, most people are focused on growing revenue and profits, uh, with about 50% looking at predictive maintenance and reducing downtime. And I think that's indicative of the fact that the first cases here are mostly coming out of manufacturing. Right? Manufacturing was a, already a very M2M -M world. It had SCADA systems. They were already monitoring production lines to a limited degree, but all confined within a factory. Okay? Um, and they weren't really using analytics. It was more for command and control and monitoring. And what they've done there is added analytics in, started bringing together data from multiple factories and production lines, and predictive maintenance is becoming one of the hottest topics. And in fact, a lot of the customers I talk to, this is where they start. So I was talking to a, um, a shipping company also in Greece yesterday, and they, they have an issue that they manufacture the systems, the navigation and radar systems in the very large ships that are out there. And before they're allowed to leave port, Somebody comes on and inspects those systems to make sure they're working. And if those systems are not working, that boat is grounded. It cannot leave port, right? And every day that they sit in port costs them hundreds of thousands of euros. So if they can predict and monitor those systems remotely, they can actually start doing some pretty interesting things to take that cost out. And shipping container companies or, or the shipping companies will pay a lot of money to not have their ships with all their staff sitting in a remote port. Okay. Um, so I talked about ThyssenKrupp, um, Rolls-Royce I talked about. The other interesting thing about Rolls-Royce is um, they, they use it for predictive maintenance, but as they collected the data, one of the things they found that was really interesting was that... Um, as the engine parts started to degrade and get to the point they might one day fail, the planes started to burn more fuel. Okay, so you would use more fuel to fly. Um, and what they found is by looking at these models, they could actually reduce the consumption of fuel in planes by replacing parts slightly earlier than they would need to normally. And per plane, if you can reduce fuel usage by 1%, you actually save $250,000 a year, right, per plane, right? And we're talking about thousands of planes. So if you think about this, their value proposition to a company is not only will this engine work more often, but we'll make sure that you are running these engines at the lowest amount of fuel. If you pay us whatever number, which I'm guessing is less than 250 k per plane, but even if it was 50 k or 100 k per plane per year, you know, it's a joint model. That's a new revenue stream they didn't previously have access to. Okay. Rockwell Automation is a, a pipeline company, so there we do remote monitoring of their pipeline. And then there's some others inside of here um, that are out there. g -Pause, by the way, is the Fitbit for your dogs, if you want to go and look them up afterwards. Um, Schneider Electric, um, they're doing some really interesting things in Nigeria with uh, remote monitoring of of outposts uh, that are running with solar panels. So they wanted to help the local community keep, um, keep medicines and things like that cool um, and, and also allow people to learn, so get electricity into remote areas. So they've set up these outposts with uh, batteries and, um, and remote and uh, what do we call them now, solar panels, my brain is going numb. 
Um, and the solar panels collect the electricity, put it in batteries, which gives them 24 by 7 electricity. And they have remote monitoring of those outposts um, using our solution. All right, the other area I'm quite uh, into is, um, keep an eye on the time here, is agriculture. I think this is one of the biggest growing areas. If you take a look at today, compared to 1950, in farming, we generate 262% more output, right? And if you think about it, we've come a long way from the days of ox and cart, uh, the, the oxen and the wooden carts and people putting the, the things in the ground by hand and harvesting by hand. Some countries are further ahead than others. Let's just be clear on that. Um, this is an industry that innovates pretty quickly. It's surprising how fast farming, at least mass scale farming, actually um, comes up. But we've got another issue, and that's that the population of the world is expected to grow 70% by 2050. And we've got to therefore produce at least 70% more food than we do today. So unless we're going to get 70% more farms and higher 70% more people, Right? We need to do something in this industry to change the game. IoT is the beginning of that journey. IoT is really a big driving point inside of here. Um, and there's a lot of things going off in the agribusiness. So I'm going to play a video here of one of our partners from Australia. And after that, I'm going to um, get one of our partners that's here in CE to stand up and point you to them. He's going to be speaking during the conference. So. Okay, so let's go ahead and play this video. It's amazing that the very thing that we depend upon for survival is subject to one of the most unpredictable forces on the planet. When you know how much of our food supply could be lost even in the tiniest variations of weather, it's a miracle that we exist. The yields in Australian ag tech business, our purpose is to feed the world without wrecking the planet. The yield takes microclimate sensing data and combines it with predictive modelling so that we can help growers improve their yields and reduce their risks. Weather can have a fairly significant impact on oysters, their filter feeders. The rain can actually cause our bays to be closed. What we need is information that helps us to make decisions regarding opening and closing, and that's where the yield fits into that mould. The yield specifically designed a sensing system that can measure the water that oysters drink, and we send this data to Microsoft's cloud. We then deliver the data in easy-to-use apps so that growers and industry regulators can make fast, informed decisions. We also use Azure Machine Learning to predict local conditions and reduce uncertainty. So only three weeks ago, we were faced with the problem of lots of rain, changes in our environment. But this time, through the yields technology and assistance, we were able to prove that the impact from the runoff was not significant enough to make us close. Twenty-five years ago, we didn't have the technology that we've got now. To work out how much water I had to put on the crop, I got a drum and a tape measure, and I measured the evaporation that came off during the day, and that way I could estimate the volume to put on for the crop. The new app takes the guesswork out of farming. It's an exact science, and the whole objective is to get high yield. We're partnering with Bosch to develop our microclimate sensing system it's an irrigation app, but it's so much more than that. Getting the water content right at harvesting time is critical for shelf life. You're never going to replace farmers. What we do is give them the technology to make their job easier. We can save the industry millions by just knowing the exact time to harvest so we can extend shelf life. Well, I'm a bit of a techie, so bring data analytics into the farming arena. We get really excited. Each year we lose about 200 tonnes of lettuce to water related issues. We believe with the yield, we can reduce that by 30%, saving the company hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. We'll be able to turn that data into useful information that we can use in the field in real time. Today we're using our technology to improve profitability for growers. But who knows? In the future, we might be relying on this type of technology to feed ourselves. The data's all there. It's just a matter of the right technology to make use of it. All right. And with that, um, Serjan, do you mind just standing up a second? Serjan here is one of our Microsoft partners. He comes from Serbia and runs a company called Dunavnet. 
that we've worked with extensively in, in the area of agriculture as well around this region. So now you know his face, you can grab him in a break and talk to him about their solutions. All right, um, I was going to do a demo of Rolls-Royce. I have a video here. I'm going to skip past it for now. If we still have time at the end, I'll, I'll come back to it, okay? Because I'd like to go through some of the other things. Um, okay, so um, what I wanted to talk here is about how we then get these things into the business. And there's two sides to that. There's how we enable the business and how we get developers up and running. What we do know is IoT projects are generally fairly difficult once you get out of the hacking phase, right? It's very easy to grab a Raspberry Pi and to grab an Arduino and to build a demo. Trust me, it's, I can do it, so it's very easy. Um, however, it's very difficult to maintain security. We're seeing a lot of different security problems right now. And um, also, it can be quite time consuming to get a real industrial scale project up and running. We also see a lot of problems with current infrastructure in many cases, the ways people have done things in the past, and scaling becomes a problem. So it's all good when you have just a few hundred users um, or a few hundred devices, but when you've got millions and tons of data, it's a different story, okay? So what we have as a company is we provide a platform, and I'm not gonna spend much time talking about our tools. That's not what I'm here to do. Um, but we talk about this thing called Azure IoT Suite, and this isn't just you know, hey, we can, we've written a broker that can read data and put it in our database, right? And we can look at that. It's actually an end-to-end -end ecosystem. It starts with the ability to put, if you want, specific SDKs and OSs on the device, which gives you security there. It moves on to having a dedicated uh, device hub that handles authentication, security, uh, two-way communication. It goes into encryption and storage in the cloud and in database goes into the actual streaming of the data, the analyzing of the data in real time, plus the storing of that historical data. It talks about analytics, machine learning, and visualization, and then ends up in the idea that you can actually do some automation going out to the field. Now, we do have some pre-configured solutions. We talked about the two things people normally start doing, connect your things, look at the data. That's remote monitoring, and so we have a pre-configured solution that people can spin up really, really quickly. And then we have predictive maintenance, which is almost the same thing, but it starts adding machine learning, okay? So the real difference between the two. So let's talk about security. Um, every time I talk to a member of the press about IoT, the only thing they care about, well, there's two things they care about. Security and is it gonna take all our jobs? That's normally where it, it starts. Nobody cares about which company it is. It's just are you gonna steal my jobs and are these things secure? So let's talk about security for a second. Security is a big issue, but if you look at commercial deployments of IoT, you will find almost no cases of, and I mean B2B, almost no cases of IoT security problems. All the security problems you see are normally created by people doing B2C, business, so to consumer applications, who don't think about security from the beginning who think I get an Arduino, I stick it in a doll, and I, I can launch a connected doll toy into the market. And then somebody hacks it and is spying on your child, and that looks really, really bad, okay? So security is a big challenge, though, because when you think about cyber attacks, cyber attacks generally happen at the point you have the biggest open surface that people can touch. And IoT is going to become the biggest surface in any organization that can be hacked, okay? So you need to be thinking about security all the way from the device itself, and that includes the keys that are used to connect to things. It includes how the data is stored and encrypted on the device. It includes how somebody can spoof and mimic that device into the connection. How do they actually authenticate and authorize themselves into the connectivity piece? Can they send their data encrypted over the wire? You need to cover all of that, okay? Um, there's two aspects to that, as I said. On our side, we, we talk a lot about securing via the OS and the SDKs and various other things. The other thing that we can offer because it's going into an industrial cloud is Microsoft's probably the platform that is attempted to be hacked the most every day anywhere in the world. We actually have thousands of security engineers monitoring Azure, Office 365, Dynamics, now LinkedIn, all of these online platforms, thousands, not just a few, but thousands. 
And what they do is when they spot an attack, they blacklist the IP addresses. And if you're using these solutions, you're automatically protected because that's populated across all of our customer estate. So you get instant cybersecurity protection because of all of these thousands of people. It's an interesting area. Um, the other thing is, before I play this video, when we think about security, very often we think about data security and data privacy. But there's another side when you start messing with machines, and that's the operational technology side of things, right? So if I have a laser and I allow somebody to turn it on remotely, and somebody's head is in front of that laser, that is not going to be pleasant. Um, so operational technology, OT, tends to deal more with safety than it does with data privacy. So what we've got with IoT is this combination of the data IT world coming together with the operational technology OT world. So when we think about security, we have to be considering both of those things. And I'm just going to run a very quick video here because I think they do a much nicer job than I can in just explaining this. So hopefully this will play. He says... 70% of the soon-to-be $1.3 trillion market for the Internet of Things will be an enterprise business. All that opportunity demands protection. Within four years, 21 billion physical devices, machines, and sensors will be connected to the Internet. Literally terabytes of data will be collected, transmitted, and analyzed daily. Advanced analytics performed on that data will enable enterprises to do remote monitoring and predictive maintenance. Microsoft enables fast deployment of secure IoT solutions that will connect your new and existing devices, providing you with the insight from data that improves your business. The industrial Internet of Things poses unique security challenges. Since we are merging the digital world of information technology with the physical world of operation technology, IT usually focuses on data security and privacy, while OT tends to focus on machine reliability and safety. To create a trustworthy Internet of Things, all defenses must be designed to work together to create a rigorous and in-depth strategy across all the various partners contributing to IoT. The comprehensive built-in security features of the Microsoft Azure IoT Suite enhance the security of your Internet of Things cloud solution. Microsoft Azure IoT Suite provides enhanced security, privacy, compliance, and threat mitigation for device, connection, and cloud security. All of our integrated cloud services, including analytics, machine learning, and storage, are built upon the same Microsoft Cloud infrastructure. In a layered approach with security built into every stage from the ground up, Azure IoT Suite helps you deploy an IoT solution, which can be trusted to transform your business quickly and securely. To learn more about IoT... Let's skip that. So, um, what I would say to you is, as you start thinking about IoT, put security first. You can't add it on later. It's really hard to bolt security on down the track, is our experience. So when you start thinking about IoT and when you think about you as a developer, think about security as absolutely one of your core priorities, especially if you want your company to survive beyond the first week of launch of your IoT solution. Okay. Um, so there's lots of different things. I talked about a lot of these. There's everything from, you know, the connection security over the wire, how we're doing device provisioning and authorization. Um, we can do remote update of firmware so that if a, 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 an exposure is found, you can actually patch that remotely. Because that's important as well. Most people think about putting the sensors out there at first, but you, we all know that everything has a flaw in it somewhere. So if you've got millions of devices deployed, how are you going to update them when they're all over the world? So you need to have an ability to remotely push firmware updates and do device provisioning over the wire. Um, and then you end up in Azure and you get access. The Azure Security Center is this, this group that's watching and monitoring for hacks. Azure Active Directory, we all know about from our company's authorization. And then there's quite a lot of policy and key vault things. So security for us is not an afterthought. It is the thought. So when we think about IoT at Microsoft, we think about security before we think about everything else. This is where I was going to do a hack, and I, I had this, um, this fantastic this is a little Arduino board here. It's got lots of cables because I have this LCD, but ultimately I had a little um, uh, water sensor. I wanted to give you a feel for how some of these agriculture solutions, for example, are working in monitoring the soil. So I had this great demo lined up, 
which I can't do. But what I did do is I went next door and I've taken some screenshots, but actually you can't see them that well either. They look really good on my screen here. Um, so let's, let's talk about it. But uh, what, I, what I did, I wanted to give you an idea. I wrote a, a simple Node.js application, right? And that Node.js application was running on my laptop. And it was communicating with the device, right? Um, and my laptop was effectively acting as a gateway, right? Those of you that don't know that, a gateway is effectively a middleman, a broker in the middle that would collect the data from the sensor and send the data up to the cloud. Okay, sometimes that can be a computer, sometimes it can just be a router of some sort, it can be you know, many different pieces of hardware. And I wrote a really simple program here, and I was gonna walk through and just show you the different bits, but you know, it's very hard to see, but you'll just have to trust me. This top piece here is, is my connection string and my authorization into, into my hub. Then I'm, I'm actually turning on all of the sensors, that's what this piece is. And then you'll get this in the slides afterwards, so hopefully you can look at it. Um, then what I'm now doing is I'm actually detecting. So what I'm doing is I'm starting to turn on the sensor and I start detecting from the sensor whether there's water present or not present. Um, and I build up a JSON message or a JSON string and then I fire that up into the cloud. And that's all the gateway is doing. It could do more intelligent stuff, it could do alerting locally, it could do all sorts of things, but really simple. So these two pieces, and the reason I wanted to show the code and, and go through that with you is I wanted to show you it's not very big and it's really not super complicated, okay? Once we get that code created, we can actually, and I did record a little video of this, we can go ahead and start our gateway, and again, the, the resolution and the, the brightness is not too smart, but afterwards, and, and what you'll see is it'll start to send messages up to the cloud, and at this point, the moisture is all zero, that's what this one is over here basically saying there's nothing going off. And then what I did is I licked my fingers and put them on the sensor here. And I, it's, a, it's very advanced demo, you see. We did have a bottle of, we did have some water for the real life thing, but, uh, and, and then we saw the values go up. And then eventually I let go and um, the values would um, go back down again. And, and that's what we see here. We see a drop back down to zero, okay? So if you imagine if that was in a field and it was irrigation over time, you would theoretically, if there's not been any rain, you'd see that water value slowly dropping. You could probably forecast and predict when it gets to critical levels. If you combine that with knowledge of if it's going to rain or not rain, then you can advise the farmer on if they should irrigate their field or not, for example. So once I've got the data in that form, then what I would do is I would go into um, Azure, and this is the Azure interface here, one of them. And I, in this case, I'm setting up something called an Azure Stream Analytics job, which is a real-time streaming engine. So I want to look at that data in real time as it's coming into my central hub. And it's fairly simple. There's an input, there's a query, and there's an output, right? Uh, the input, and again, you'll get these after. I'll spread them over slides so that the animations don't hide things. The input is, is basically saying, go to my IoT hub and take all the stream that's coming there. I want to look at everything. So it's grabbing a whole bunch of JSON files and it's converting them into something that I can then write a really basic SQL-like statement to. So all I'm doing there is I'm reading everything, right? Select star, because I couldn't be bothered to write anything else. And I'm writing that out into, into a specific um, location. And that specific location is defined here and it's going out to the Power BI tool, the visualization tool of, of Microsoft. It could go straight into another database, it could be being sent to SAP, it could go anywhere, right? I've just chosen here to do it via Power BI. And if I detect an anomaly, I could trigger application logic to, for example, if I notice the temperature of a machine has gone above a certain level, I can actually send a command to just turn the machine off, right? That's what we can do with two-way communication. Then what I wanted to show here, and I did another video, because I was trying to show a little bit, um, in this case, um, in Power BI, I wanted to just show um, things going off. So we're going to see here, I'm going to start up the same application again. Um, please excuse the kludginess. I did it very quickly next door. Um, so it's firing up the application, and it's going to start generating a data feed. Again, a slightly different one. Let me just, um, in the interest of time, jump in a little bit further, because I know it takes a while to generate the data set. So eventually, you'll see a a data set pop up inside of here, it'll be called moisture, because that's what I called it from that output. 
Um, we just need to wait for that to appear because it needs, it needs enough data first to start to, to visualize um, on the first run. So let's jump in a bit more until it decides. There it is. Okay. That's the beauty of videos, right? I don't need to wait. It's like the, here's the one I baked earlier. Um, so here we've now got this data set, moisture data. And what I'm going to do, that's now the streaming data that's coming in off the sensor. And that would have been live data. I'm now going to go ahead and create a dashboard. And I, I was trying to get smart to show you I didn't record this before I got here. So I called it Bosnia near real time. Um, you know, and I wanted to write, sorry, it's not really live. Um, that was what I was aiming to do. Um, probably this video I can make available to you guys afterwards as well. This is, this is pretty straightforward stuff. And I'm going to create here a real-time uh, visualizer in inside of here. And I, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to choose the fields that came in from that data. And that's, that's what this piece is doing. Um, so I said I want a line chart. I'm adding a timestamp. I'm adding the moisture data piece. Um, and then I'm setting that I want to see 60 seconds worth of data in this case. I could have it showing 60 hours, 60 minutes, whatever. I'll just go ahead and refresh the page here because it was a new data source, so it doesn't straight away do it. Give it one second. And what we'll then see is when it comes back up, we'll start to see the visualization. So as I said, it is so you saw you have to see everything. My refreshes, I didn't edit it. Um, and we see the zeros, and then I, I just for, for effect here on this, I again lick my fingers, picked up my little sensor, and uh, we'll see the moisture start to climb, and hopefully we'll see the, the visualization pop back up. And really, I, the reason I wanted to show that live is I built all of that in five minutes. That's how simple it is to build an end-to-end -end IoT application. Now, of course, in the real world, this wouldn't survive very long in a field. Right, the first rain, my sensor will be dead. So on an industrial sense, there's work that needs to be done to make the sensor more robust and rigid. But ultimately, the same principles of pulling the data in over the cloud, visualizing it in real time, and taking action, they all, they all apply. And it's super fast. So you don't need to be a whiz-bang super scientist to build these sorts of applications and to put them into your organization anymore. Okay? So that was the little up and down track. So, um, good, we're almost on time. So, in terms of the system, Microsoft's policy is we want to work with everything and anything. A lot of people are confused. They think Microsoft only wants to work if it's running Windows, and it's not the case. In fact, almost every device, I would say the majority that we work with, are not running any form of Windows. They're running Linux, and in some cases, nothing at all, because there's no point. If you have a thermometer, it doesn't need an operating system, right? So. Um, in that case, it doesn't really matter. There are many different operating systems that we support. Any sort of device, you can write in multiple languages. Protocols, we've got some good support for protocols out there. The main ones, MQTT, AMQP, um, LW, M2M, HTTP and HTTPS if you want to fire over the wire. Um, you can push out to pretty much anything. So when you take action, if you want to trigger something into Salesforce or into, into Oracle or into SAP, we don't really care. We want you to get value. And if the value means driving an operational application that isn't Microsoft, so be it. Um, and then you know, we can start talking about some other things here. I didn't talk about some of this, the device and the gateway SDKs. So yesterday, we had a very large conference in the US. And I couldn't put it in my slides because it wasn't announced yet, but we announced something called Azure IoT Edge. And that's the ability now to take some of those services that you just saw, some of the machine learning and some of the other things, and run them actually at the edge with no connectivity to the cloud. And then when you reconnect, you can fire your data up to the cloud. So we can now do offline uh, work in exactly the same way we can do online work. And it's the same code. So you create it online, and then you push it down to the device um, for the offline work. So uh, quite excited about that. I think it's going to open up a lot of things. We also at Hanover Messer about, gosh, I was there, when was that? Three weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Can't remember anymore. Um, we announced something called Connected Factory. Um, a lot of people in manufacturing on their production line use something called OPC UA. Um, and it's, it's basically a, a protocol that's used in SCADA systems to collect data. And, and that data can go to ERP systems very often. But we forked that so we can pull that data up and we can now look at this same data that's being collected inside of our cloud. And that's important for manufacturers because very often they have, um, 
they have a whole collection of different production lines. And within one factory, they can see each production line, but across all the factories, they very often can't. So using this, you can actually bring up all their factories, all their production lines globally or within a country. So, so if I really look at the end-to-end -end story here, um, this is what we talk about. We talk about it being secure. You'll notice secure is always our first point because if we provide you great tools and you've got no security end-to-end, -end, then you're not going to work with us and we're exposing your company to a lot of pain. So when you start thinking about IoT, make sure whoever you're talking to can explain end-to-end -end themselves how they do this. If they have to go to several different partners, then the chances are you have a risk and at a break point on between every partner, so very important. Fast, so we talked about pre-configured solutions. If you want to quickly get remote monitoring or predictive maintenance, you can fire up a template, be up and running in minutes, feed your data in and get going. Of course, you customize that afterwards, so it's not a finished solution. You notice it doesn't say finished, number one, well best out of the box solution, because that doesn't exist either. Um, it will be customized heavily towards your organization and what you want to do. Open, we're open. We're, we're not restricting to storing the data in HANA or storing the data in Oracle or SQL. Choose where you want to store it. Choose the device you want to connect to. Choose what action you want to take on the back end. Um, one of the things, I, I've been at Microsoft for a little over, over 18, no, 15 months now. And um, one of the things that's amazed me about Microsoft is how it is open now. Um, and when I looked from the outside in the past, that wasn't the case. But when it comes inside now, I can tell you, they want, or we want, simply to be the IoT platform. And we don't care where you're putting your data and what you're doing with it. We just want you to put your IoT tools and things on our platform. And scalable, right? So we can start on-prem, we can go to the edge, we can go to the cloud. We have um, more data centers globally than Google um, and Amazon combined. Um, so in terms of the cloud, the public cloud, we're, we're way, way, way ahead. Um, and that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about um, getting out there and doing that. So just to wrap up, because I've only got five minutes, um, yeah. Uh, to wrap up, the winner or loser is really going to be defined by what you do next, right, as this transformation takes hold. So when you think about IoT, you can, of course, think about and start playing with Arduino boards. What I will tell you is you... You have some very interesting discussions going through airport security with these things. <laughs> um, so, um, especially into the US, I can tell you. You think they're, they want to check your, your computer for social network activity after you've seen that. Um, so, the winner or the loser is really um, defined by what you do next, but you must start playing with this stuff. I, I think any developer that isn't in this world of IoT, or in this world of data-based services and analytics and machine learning, down the line, your skills are going to start to become less and less relevant. And I think the reason you're all here is because you, you're in that space and you're moving, so that's fantastic. And from a business angle, I don't think there's any business that won't be doing something in this space in time. Now, as I said at the beginning, let's go back to my exponential curve. I don't know this market as well as you do. Let's just be honest. And it could well be that within this market, it's a longer time until that, that curve really takes off. But I will tell you this, it is going to take off. Whether it's one year behind neighboring countries or two years behind, it will go. Um, because as soon as they start to see what other people are doing, those companies that are doing that elsewhere will recognize the market opportunity and will appear here. So as organizations, it's better for you to be first rather than chasing. Um, and you need to be thinking not just about devices, sensors, and connecting things, but what are the services you're going to drive? What are the efficiencies you're going to drive? What's the new business models? Um, and that's when I think about IoT. I go all the way back to the beginning. IoT is not a technical re revolution. It's really about changing businesses and changing the way we do business and also helping us to look after the planet and do things in a more socially responsible way way as, as the number of humans on the planet grows. And with that, um, that is what I've got. Um, I do have the, the Rolls-Royce demo, but it takes a little bit longer than what we, we have left there, so I will, I will leave that. 
Um, I will see if I can provide to the organizers some of the videos I've got here so that you can get them afterwards. Um, and hopefully then you can take a closer look at them yourselves. But otherwise, um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that it was interesting and I hope it wasn't too Microsoft centric. Um, I'm very passionate about this. Do follow me on Twitter. I'm always happy to have a dialogue there with anybody that wants to have one. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh huh.